turns have the, di uh, the radius of the order of 10 to the minus certain centimeters. Yeah. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that would correspond to momentum P, which is 1 over uh, N, approximately equal to mass of pi, and this is approximately uh, 0.1 GeV, which is not accidental because uh, pi, as we think, is uh, particle responsible for nuclear structure. This is the size of nuclear. So, uh, to explore the, the structure of, of proton, we need to use some microscope with wavelengths which is uh, smaller, much smaller than this 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. So, we need to have lambda, which is much smaller than uh, n. And therefore, we need to have scattering of particles with momenta bigger than 0.1 uh, GeV. So not only this, we want to explore the scattering on big scattered angles. So it is this what probes internal structure. You just have uh, forward scattering and you do not probe much. So which means that uh, you need to have big enough transfer momentum. So scattering on large angles. And uh, transfer momentum is proportional to scattering angle. It's momentum of particle multiplied by sine theta scattering. So um, to probe very small structures, you need to have this Q of the order of energy. So that would correspond to scattering on, on big mixing, on big angles. Uh, so here we come to conclusion that to explore the properties of nucleons, we need to have transfer momentum and so we are defining positive uh, value which is Q square moduli square. Uh, in fact, this Q square for momentum is negative if you have scattering in T channel. <laughs> so if you have particle scatters and then it exchanges by some other particle photon, for instance, with proton. So this Q should be bigger than 1 GeV square, so then we will satisfy such a condition. And the energy of particle which we use to probe the structure of, uh, of nucleons should be bigger than 1 GeV. Okay. So that lambda is 10 to the minus 14 in this case. Uh, look, we can use actually electrons or muons on neutrinos. So these are particles which were used to explore the structure of a nucleons. Let me give you an example when you have electron scattered from proton. And in the final state, you have electron and everything else. So electron is incoming particle, interacts with proton, and produce a number of secondary particles in general. So this interaction is due to exchange of photon. This is electromagnetic interaction. So in this way, we probe electromagnetic structure of proton. this in a more clear way. We have electron, which emits photon. That interacts with proton. And in final state, we have some number of particles, x. 
Uh, so what is important that transfer momentum is big and transfer momentum is nothing but for momentum of gamma. So that's gamma. Essentially our Q is, is gamma. Okay. So this is transfer momentum. This is initial electron. This is final. So Q is uh, Q uh, prime minus Q minus Q prime, so if moment, for momentum of uh, electron is, uh, is, uh, is prime, Q prime and initial is Q, then we have this relation. So let me put here the left. So that then from conservation of energy momentum in this vertex we have this relation, this is gamma. So let me put gamma here. Now, what, what are the events when you have this big transfer momentum? When you have big transfer momentum for energy to, to this hadronic system, usually in final state, you have uh, many particles. It's not just proton, but you produce in this way pines in addition to protons. So this is the hadronic system. It may be even K mesons. So you may produce a number of particles here. Of course, K mesons should go in pair because you, want. you have here conservation of, of strangeness. So this is what we call deep inelastic scattering. Elastic scattering exactly would correspond to Q squared equals zero, but also we call elastic scattering often uh, the scattering when you have just the same particles and as in initial state. So here, what is important, we have big transfer momentum uh, to the uh, to this uh, to the proton, to the nuclear. And in this way, we can probe uh, the structure of proton in general. So what is the result of this scattering again? There were a series of the experiments where uh, initial or probe particle was uh, electron uh, or muon and also neutrinos. The result of these experiments on deep and elastic scattering is that, in fact, uh, with large probability, the scattering proceeds with large Q squared. So, scattering. large Q square has large probability. So in quantum theory this is important probability because of course you have always some probability that scattering occurs at a big angle. But what is important that large number of events with large Q square has been observed. So, what is conclusion? Like in Rutherford experiment, the conclusion is that electric charge, and in this way we probe distribution of electric charge in the proton, is not distributed uniformly in the volume occupied by a nucleon, but it is concentrated on some much smaller objects which are sitting inside the nucleon. So, electric charge is not distributed uniformly but it is concentrated in uh, smaller objects. This means that nucleons, or proton, neutron, 
are composite states. of, in the first approximation you can say, point-like objects which carry the electric charge and also weak charge because the same kind of qualitatively a result has been obtained in scattering of neutrinos and uh, neutrinos probe so-called weak charge of the particle so these objects are point-like objects are called partons well actually we cannot claim that this is point-like object so this is kind of first approximation, you can say, okay, let's try to, to see if it is point-like or not, and then we should check if it is really point-like, which means that we need to have even better uh, resolution. But at least what we can say from these observations is that electric charge is concentrated on some object which are, have the size much smaller than the size of the nucleon. This is what we can say from this experiment. The size of these partons should be smaller than the size of the nucleon. So the only way what experiment tells us that our say, parton is much smaller than the radius of nucleon. And we have uh, such a structure, we have nucleon and then uh, some objects inside and electric charge is concentrated on, on these objects. Questions? And the fact is that we have many events with scattering of big uh, Q square. In quantum again, uh, theory, you have even if you have uniform, there's still some chance that small, very small probability that you have scattering on big angle. Yeah. Uh, can we infer the masses of these particles? Uh, not from this, not from this, um, not from this uh, uh, the first these measurements, because we, what we probe here is uh, really a distribution of charge. Distribution of charge. Uh, so, this is the first, yeah? yeah. So, also, can we. Uh, Experimentally with the scatter, if the deep elastic scatter, the sign of the charge, the, the, the sign of the sign of the charge of loose point. Like well, eventually, yes, uh, we have uh, measured what are. Of course, uh, we know that the charge, the, the total charge, should be positive. It should be one, right? So, which means that uh, that there are some objects which probably have partial charge of uh, of proton, right? So eventually, in, uh, uh, in this scattering, indeed, it was established what the, what the charge is of these partons. Let me answer to your question later, because the situation is a little bit more complicated, since we have also so-called quark antiquark or parton antiparton pairs. So they have also, but these kind of objects, so these pairs are, are neutral. So they care individually charged, but they now, the, the, the structure is more, a little bit more complicated. The answer to your question, yes, so we can measure the, the charge of the, of the particles. And eventually this has been done. So not only this, what has been found is that this scattering obeys the properties of scaling. So what is this, a more precise, the Bjorken scaling? So let us consider um, the scattering of electron on a proton, for instance. 
And a cross section in general can be even as differential cross section d sigma over d q square as d sigma over d q square and let me write here point like multiplied by some function of q square. So this is what we call structure function. And it describes deviation of result of the scattering from scattering of a point like object. So this is cross section computed uh, for this scattering in assumption that proton is point like. There is no distribution, there's no in, in internal structure. So this function, structure function, describes precisely a deviation and possible substructures of the cross. So we call this structure function or form factors, if you want. Sometimes you need this form factors. Okay. So let me draw again the diagram that you had already by slightly different way. We have scattering of electron with exchange of gamma. We have nucleon, proton or neutron. We have X in final state. So uh, I use here let me write this Q E Q A prime. This is gamma and let me not to put any index, just put Q. This is Pn, momentum of, of nucleon. So again, Q is transfer momentum. So this is for momentum. And let us focus on this part, which is important for probing the structure. So we have photon with certain form momentum Q, which interacts with our nucleon. Here we have the following variables. We have momentum of nucleon, and we have momentum of uh, gamma, right? Q is form momentum of gamma. And therefore, in general, our structure function is the function of Q and Pn. Okay? Because we have two here kinematical variables. We have here photon and we have initial momentum of, <laughs> of nuclear. What has been found experimentally that actually F depends not separately on Q and P, but it depends on this uh, variables in combination xb which is minus q square over 2 qpn So this means that if, for instance, we increase momentum uh, Q, transfer momentum by factor of 2, and simultaneously increase the momentum of uh, our nuclear by factor of 2, nothing is changed. You will have the same distribution. Okay, so the scaling of Q and P by the same quantity doesn't change the result. Doesn't change your structure functions. And this is what is called scaling. So this is the scaling. The fact that F depends only on this combination, so F is, let me put here, Fxb, and this is Bjorken variable, X is what we call scale. independently 
But this combination, and this means again that we're scaling by Q of Q and P momentum of a nuclear by the same quantity doesn't change structure function. So which means that if you have, you know, you increase energy of your incoming particle and you in this way in this way change uh, this Q and also increase correspondingly the momentum of nuclear, the result will be the same. So this is uh, Lorentz invariant combination, right? So that's uh, all these in four uh, four dimensional variables. In the rest frame of uh, of nucleon, when P n is just mass of the nucleon. Uh, momentum is zero. Maybe I'll write here small momentum of nuclear is zero. This variable x becomes q square uh, two m nucleon multiplied by this new and new as exchange of energy, the change of energy of scattered particle. Okay? <laughs> Questions? Mm, the scale, uh, the if we increase the Q with two and reduce Oh, you see, Q is in a uh, in denominator and in denominator. So, so essentially, that is uh, changing as Q over Pn. And therefore, when you change in the same way, Q and Pn, you will get the same as Xp. OK? So who knows how to explain scaling? You see, this is just, this is observation. Okay. Now we'll try to find the theory, find the explanation of this scaling phenomenon. Who knows how it? You don't know. I just randomly say something. Tell, tell something. Well, uh, if there is some structure inside and if it emits photon like this in its rest frame, it comes something like an excited state and it comes back again. What comes? Uh, it has a, the nucleon has some substructure that can be excited and it emits photon outside. Well, there is no emission of photon in, in the process we, we have discussed here, so there is no photon here. This is the system. Well, it can be photon here, of course, but, but this is essentially the system. Right. I meant the transfer momentum side, but it's not a real photon. So this is virtual photon, yes. of course, yeah. Okay. So have you started to discuss virtual particles in QFT course. Okay. So look how many things come from these observations. And that's what Bjorken and actually Feynman have uh, developed. Uh, do you remember this? Remember this quantity? Well, if I read on it, because we will come back to, to this. So the scaling. can be explained if if you assume that partons appear as in these interactions as free particles
non-interacting between each other. So that at high enough energies, and we, again, this is important that we deal here with high enough energies, especially an energy when we go to uh, center of mass system, if you want. So that the nucleon can be considered as just flux non-interacting particles. enough energies of, uh, of nucleon, it can be considered as just flux of freely moving partons. And each of these partons take part of momentum of, of nucleon. What we introduce to describe this, we introduce x variable, which is momentum of parton, and let me put here Q, because eventually, already in the beginning, people start to think that maybe this structure, these partons are actually quarks we are discussing. At least some of them are quarks. So uh, for, for this reason, the picture was called quark, quark parton structure of, of nucleons. So we introduce variable X, which is a ratio of of momentum of a given uh, parton over total momentum of uh, nuclear. And so partons share total momentum of nuclear. And of course, x changes from 0 to 1, right? So maximal momentum parton can take is 1 which means that whole momentum of, of proton essentially concentrated on a single part. But you have a general distribution. So you have a number of partons, and some, say, bring 0.1, some 0.5, some 0.3 of momentum of initial uh, nuclear. So this is the first. Let me add here for high energy. So all this picture is valid when you have high enough energies. So which means that you can go always if, if the energy of particle you use, electron or neutrino or muon, is high enough, then you can go to the system when proton moves with high uh, enough velocity. And then you can have this picture for, for this proton and for scattering. So what happens is the following. We have electron. And in this system, we have collision of electron with this flux of partons. And what happens is that electron scatters on one of these partons. And this is why they notice. And therefore, ah, so another important, so that's second. And scattering on individual partons proceeds independently.
and incoherently, which means that a total cross section is the sum of the cross sections on individual partons, and you have the sum over partons. implies that um, 1 over Q, this is transfer momentum, is um, much smaller than distance between partons. Right? Then you can consider this process in coherently. So you have high enough energy of incoming particle, electron in this case. Its lambda wavelength is small enough and so you have no kind of overlap, so you have scattering on different partons individually. And then you sum up cross-section, not amplitude, but you sum up effect of scattering on different partons uh, at the cross-section level, at the probability level. Questions? So, here is example of scattering on this part of, but then you need to cons consider scattering on this, that one, that, and then sum up everything. So, I have written here the sum, but what we are usually doing, we are introducing continuous distribution. We introduce distribution of partons. and x. This can be considered as the probability to find a parton with a given x. And the number of partons in the interval dx is given by nx times dx. So this is the density of partons and then number of partons in the interval dx is given by uh, by nx times dx. And therefore, differential equation for total scattering can be written as sigma on individual parton multiplied by nx times dx. And then total cross-section is given by integral. can be considered as the probability to find parton with a given fraction x of total momentum of nuclear. Now look at this formula. What we have found already, quite interesting. We can further assume that Partons are structureless. So partons, I have some numeration, this is second. Now this is the third statement. Point like objects. If so, then this cross-section corresponds to scattering on the point-like object. And then what is staying here is nothing but structure function. 
so that this is structure function. So that structure function, as you have discussed, is actually proportional to this n x. Let me remind, repeat what are assumptions behind uh, 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 this result, which we have, right? So, first we consider at high energies the photon moving with high energies, having high, high energies, and the flux of particles. Second, these particles do not interact between each other, so it's like a free flux of these particles. Finally, we consider that these particles are point-like objects, and therefore total cross-section on, on, on nucleon is given by scattering on individual particles, which is point-like, multiplied by the number density of particles. Okay? So in this case, they arrived at the conclusion that the structure function, in this case, is given by just the number density of particles. Okay? So next step is the following. What is this x? So we introduced x here as the fraction of uh, total momentum of nucleon, which a given quark cares, right? So now let us consider the scattering at individual particles. We have electron, we have here Q, and now these are particles already. Now let me denote this momentum of uh, initial particle, and this is momentum of uh, final particle. So uh, let us write um, energy and momentum conservation at, at this point, and it is Q. <laughs> photon plus Q initial particle and it should be equal to Q final particle. Okay? So this is satisfied because uh, our photon is uh, 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 not on the mass shell, it's virtual particle. For virtual particle we can satisfy uh, energy so four momentum conservation in this way. Right? So we have P, Q coming here. Let me put it even here. Right? And Q is here, and then that's what we have in the final state is P. Right? So let us square this. And what we will get is Q squared plus 2Q PQ plus P. I'm sorry. What what I did? Excuse me. Let me let me put correct notations. Right. So it's uh, PQ and here is PQ. Excuse me. This is PQ, this is PQ prime. And it will be PQ squared, and this will be PQ prime squared. Agree? So look again. <laughs> Excuse me. That's, that's patterns. These are moment of patterns. This is conservation for momentum in the vertex. So I just square this. Now what is this? This is the mass of particle. This is the mass of the square of final particle. 
So I'm considering here that the particle is the same in the initial and final state. And these are square four momentum. They cancel. And so from here, we, what we have is that um, we have the 2QPQ equals minus Q squared. Now remember we introduced PQ as uh, X multiplied by PN. As we introduced X, which is PQ over PN. Let us insert this in, in that equation. And from this equation we will get two Q X PN equals minus Q squared. And therefore, we get that x equals minus q squared over 2qpn. And if you compare with expression for Bjorken variable, you will find out that this is exactly xb, Bjorken variable. And so coming back to to this, to this result, we find out that this f should depend on xb. And in this way, we have uh, proven that you can get the scaling. So this is the scaling that, uh, that Bjorken has found. So, that explains, now gives, what is the physical meaning of uh, Bjorken variable x. The meaning of Bjorken variable x, as follows from our consideration, is that this is the fraction of momentum of nucleon. which is carried by by parton on which scattering occurs. So, if you see some event in which we have this Bjorken variable xb, so which means that for a given event we measure what is q squared, we know what is the momentum of initial nucleon. So we can find for each event what is x. And the meaning of this x, it gives us the fraction of momentum of nucleon which carried by parton on which scattering occurred. Okay? So, variable xb is essentially momentum of parton on which scattering occurred. Or, in other words, we have a fixed target experiment that is usually happen, and you see that there is an event with a given Q square, which means that you can recover what, uh, you can find what is X, and in this way you measure momentum of parton on which scattering occurred. Yeah? We have uh, a short value of this this momentum or we have like spectrum of, of the um, 
the partons inside. Yeah, partons. Are, so what is assumed, of course, that that you have nucleon, and inside the nucleon you have partons uh, with different x. But if you have observed a single event with a given q square, then you can reconstruct what was the fraction of uh, parton on which scattering occurred. Okay, and so in this way we also reproduce the scaling, right? So we find that, that uh, in fact the structure function is determined by xb, which coincides with x. To have fixed target doesn't mean that the parton is at rest. Again, so, you know, that's uh, Lorentz invariant considerations better to, to have this consideration uh, when you uh, look at the proton as moving fast and you have this collision. Then you have this flux. It's obscure when you go to the rest frame of the proton. Yeah? Within the energy of scattering that we have, uh, can we say that to, to use that uh, subtraction of the two uh, two masses, that the scattering does not um, change the the barton's masses. Yes, right, right, right. Especially here, you see, we have the scattering uh, uh, due to photons, and uh, the photons have so-called diagonal interaction, which means the photon interacts with charged particle, and it doesn't change the type of the particle, right? So that's, it's a little bit more complicated when you have W boson. Because W boson changed the type of the quark. And people discussed also, uh, of course, measured this uh, uh, using neutrinos and therefore W boson. However, the masses of light quarks within the nucleon are so small that you can just neglect them and neglect the difference. And if you have scattering of, uh, say, on D quark, with W boson, uh, 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 then you have uh, U quark in final state, and here you would put the mass of the say, U quark and here, uh, here D quark. But they are so small in comparison with all these energies in the world, so corrections are negligible. More questions? We can have this kind of experiment using like bios to see quark quark scattering or something like that. Maybe a different, a strong interaction. Well, in principle, yes, and uh, uh, but uh, this is more clean experiment. Now, now the question: What you probe? So, uh, by scattering using electrons, mm -hmm. you probe how electric charge is distributed. Mm -hmm. When you have pions then it's kind of dirty experiment because you have strong interactions which uh, actually will dominate everything eventually. That will, uh, so a W boson has been discovered and I will shortly discuss this maybe next lecture in scattering of protons on antiprotons. And you use again this uh, parton structure which means that you have proton which is flux of quarks uh, or partons and that's, you have antiprotons which is another flux of and this picture gave very good description. So you just uh, consider the, the collisions of two fluxes, two free fluxes of quark partons of partons. And, uh, and then each parton interacts individually with the other. With another uh, uh, parton, and so you produce W boson, for instance, which then decay, you see this result. And then you need, of course, to make integrations over partons. So in a sense, you know, in this way, you also probe the, this parton structure using nucleons. But the cleanest way is to use electrons or neutrinos, because in this case, you probe weak charge. And actually, using different scatter uh, 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 particles you scatter, you can probe what we, got, what we discussed already. You can actually determine what is electric charge, because you have kind of independent measurements of the same distributions. One is sensitive to uh, the weak interactions, another one to electromagnetic interactions. So that can be, that was used. And also you can use not only proton, you can use neutron, or you can use deutron, for instance. Using this one can really uh, extract what are the properties of partons. Now let me say a little bit more on this.
Um, densities of quarks give for us uh, the structure functions. Actually, what happens is you make measurements and you can measure this because you measure structure functions. So you do these deep and elastic experiments and you can measure uh, the structure functions. And what happens is that actually these densities are divergent at, at small x. Uh, here is something like this. So this x, this is 1. And here is nx. What is not divergent is the product x multiplied by nx. And this, it turns out, actually what usually we use when we compute cross-sections. Usually this nx appears always with this x, and so uh, you, have, uh, uh, you have final result. Now, using different deep and elastic experiments, we could really recover what is the pattern structure. And what happens is that, uh, let me write it, you know this uh, structure, really, of nucleons. So nucleons consist of even two types of uh, partons. One corresponds to valence quarks. So these are the quarks which carry quantum numbers of particles. In the case of protons, protons, so we have u, u and d quark, right? So we have three quarks. And now we're already moving uh, to identification. So the, already in the beginning it was the idea that the Spartans are actually quarks. And so in this connection we, we can talk about valence quarks and in proton we have uh, U, U and D quarks. And therefore you will have uh, a distribution of U quarks. And you have distribution of D quarks which means that gives you the probability that you find, for instance, u quark with a given x, or d quark with a given x. And so the partons which carry the quantum numbers, electric charges, or isospin in this case, if it is strange hadron, you can you, you introduce also s quark. So those are particles which bring quantum numbers. And those distribution, distribution have the form of this type. So on, on average, this valence quarks brings a one third of momentum of proton. Um, so this maximum corresponds to say, say one third. But on the top of this, inside the nucleons, you have quark-antiquark -quark pairs and what we call C of the quarks and anti-quark pairs. This is another component, which means that somehow inside the nucleon you have production of quark-anti-quark -quark pairs. And this C of quark anti quark pairs has uh, uh, such a distribution. So this is valence. And this is a C of the quark anti quark pairs. And then the sum is what I have shown you before. 
What is interesting that in the C, you can find U, U bar quark, D, D bar quark, and even strange anti-strange quark inside the nucleus, inside the proton, and even heavier quarks. But of course they are virtual and they have zero strangeness, for instance, total strangeness is zero because these are quark-anti-quark -quark pairs. As we will see, they are actually produced by valence quarks. So you have emission of gluon uh, and then production of quark-anti-quark -quark pairs. Of course they can pr be produced electromagnetically also, but this is more efficient. And so we will see how that happens. Uh, you said that quarks or particles are not interacting with each other. So, uh, what in uh, high, when we consider high energy collisions, mm -hmm. so that tricky point is uh, uh, when you have high and uh, high energy collisions, mm -hmm. then you can treat them uh, as independent. So normally, uh, in, a, in a stress frame, we can see both valence quarks and C of quarks uh, caused by the interactions. Now, this what we actually what uh, this picture is better seen at high energies. So that that I refer still to high energies. So the result of scattering at high energies can be described in this way. And uh, we will see that uh, justification for this is so-called asymptotic freedom. When we go a little bit about, uh, I will talk about QCD, which means that strong interactions become weak at higher energies, and therefore that justifies uh, such a picture. But picture changes when you go to lower energies. So you need to live with this. Electrons can scatter one of these CO. Yeah, yes, of course. Yeah, in the same way, it's just you know. Uh, you actually need to sum up these two. These are just two components, and uh, then uh, scattering occurs. You cannot even probably distinguish. So if you are here, then with a kind of almost equal probability that will be C quark or, or, or valence quark. Uh, what we'll also find out soon that. Uh, People measure these distributions, and people have found, integrated them, and they have found what is total momentum which quarks or particles, quarks more precisely, care. And it turns out, it turned out that uh, uh, amount of momentum carried by all the quarks is smaller than one. So you would expect that eventually you integrate everything and you will get one, because you will get the momentum of the nuclear. So what people have observed that it's not one, it's 0 0.5 approximately. Which means that there's something else apart from these quarks or charged particles which are inside the nucleon. And that was a, what, what we call gluons. So that's uh, another component which we will discuss uh, next. Yeah? Um, if you are saying uh, there is no interaction between different mm -hmm. uh, particles, mm -hmm. uh, what causes these gluons to exist? Like, uh, well, they exist. Why, why, why not? They, they still exchange with some small. Uh, the coupling constant becomes small. Well, what we will see actually at uh, the presence of uh, uh, of gluons at higher energies still uh, manifests itself by violation of scaling. There's still violation of the scaling. So that is kind of a picture when you which you can find, say, in asymptotics, where you have extremely high energies and everything. So that, then you have also gluons, which are just uh, another component, which doesn't interact with photons. So another carrier. It's also particle. So we, we can say that this is also one of the components of particles. OK? So now we move to uh, the next topic, precisely gluons, as uh, another component of, of hadrons. Again, address some questions. And we actually measure these uh, distributions independently for all types of the quarks. So we have such a distribution for U quark, for, uh, for D quark, for U anti quark, for D anti quark. So now let's look at all this detailed structure.
blancs. So let me start with history and first what I want to discuss is color. What is this color? What is this degree of the freedom? And the color was introduced in 1964, I think, in attempts to resolve the following problem. The problem of existence of uh, hadrons such as, say, delta plus plus. Remember, in, uh, I have written some this, uh, this, uh, multiplets, I don't know, some of these multiplets contains this delta plus plus. Uh, these are particles, hadrons with a spin 3 over 2. So the same can be obtained using omega minus, remember, that was fi final component of decuplet. So we discussed this also. But let me focus on this because that was already before omega and the problem appeared even before this. So what is the quark structure if we believe in quark structure of this particle? It's three U quarks. So delta plus plus consists of three U quarks which have polarization in the same direction. So this way you reproduce, first of all, elec double electric charge, because each of them has, has electric charge two-thirds. And you have the spin three half, so that so all three uh, quarks should be polarized in the same way. And uh, as usually we think that the lowest state corresponds to orbital momentum to be zero. So what you will have here, the state, with three U quarks, uh, actually, the, the, uh, so delta particle with three U quarks in the same state. And now we have the problem with Pauli principle, right? According to which we cannot have uh, even two particles in one state, but here we have three. So suggestion can, has been made by uh, Greenberg, Han, and Nambu. <coughs> who said that we can introduce actually additional degree of freedom which distinguish different types of the quarks and they call this color and what they are saying, so it's a new degree of freedom new quantum number. So that actually quarks carry this uh, quantum number, put in this, which can take three different values. It's more or less obvious, right? So what we have new quantum number and I can be say red, yellow, blue. So in the early days people used this really color in uh, identification we're just now using one two three right? so in this case we can construct the wave function of delta which should be anti-symmetric right with respect to say, due to power principle in the following way so it's wave function of i j product and u, k, and so, and we can use this anti-symmetric tensor, i, j, k, so that uh, all three indices are different. And therefore, there is no problem with, uh, uh, with a Pauli principle. We have three different u quarks, which care this color. And we can construct anti-symmetric uh, combination of this. Because if you would have the same I and J, they cannot construct anti-symmetric uh, 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 combination. Uh, Pauli principle says that if you have two fermions and you interchange them, then the, the sign should change. Okay. Well, actually, the same idea has been suggested uh, independently by 
Bogolubov ta Felice Strumiński in Dubna. Actually, if you remember uh, uh, group theory of SU3, so this is invariant tensor in this symmetry group, which gives you invariant combinations. This anti symmetric, completely anti symmetric uh, tensor with three indices. So far, so good. Uh, by the way, this omega, I have written omega minus, it consists of three D quarks. And the story is the same. You have three D quarks, the charge is minus one. And uh, again, you have problem with Pauli principle, which can be resolved if you attach additional degree of freedom for D quarks. Already in the beginning, actually Nambu mentioned that probably color is not just uh, some quantum number for classification. But color has dynamical nature. So it's coupling constant for some new interactions of quarks. So quarks have additional interactions. And color is charged with, for these uh, new interactions. In the same way as electric charge is uh, coupling constant for, for, for electromagnetic interactions. So it's color dynamical characteristic. And in fact, it can be cop coupling constant. Of some new interactions of quarks. It was idea that probably those are the interactions, really strong interactions, which are responsible for the structure of uh, nucleons and then nuclei eventually. So of course, when people introduce quarks and then consider them seriously as uh, constituents of nucleons, it was idea that it should be some new interaction between quarks. Neither electromagnetic nor uh, weak interactions cannot keep the quarks inside the nucleons and cannot explain the nuclear structure, so creation of nuclei. So, and then Nambu has this idea that probably color is precisely the charge of these new interactions, strong interactions, which are responsible for all this hadronic structure. The gauge theory of color has been constructed by Fritsch, Gelman, and Lloyd Wheeler. In 1971, soon after a standard model has been uh, introduced, but renormalization hasn't been done. So standard model was kind of uh, in very big initial phase where nobody essentially even cited for long for several years. Nobody even cited one that paper. And, uh, then it was explored. Of course, after it has shown that this is a renormalizable theory. So uh, these three guys have uh, introduced gauge symmetry of color. So they say the following, that quarks, say U, um, red, U, yellow, 
Yeah. Blue form the triplet. Which transforms Under representation three of SU three group. So I call this color group. SU three group. Don't confuse with the flavor. SU three we discussed before. So this is another degree, another dimension, if you want. So they constructed the gauge theory, which is generalization of U1 for electromagnetic interactions. Of course, I will not develop these the things. But here, the difference is that we have non-abelian symmetry. U1 is abelian symmetry. Here, is, this is a non-abelian symmetry. Now, to realize gauge symmetry, we need to introduce gauge bosons. And in this case, one is to introduce eight gauge bosons, so which transform under a joint representation of SU3. So this is the way we are constructing uh, the gauge theory. So to have gauge invariance, you need to introduce these gauge fields. And in this case, uh, eight gauge fields should be introduced, which are called gluons. which transform under representation 8, or a joint representation of SE3. So these gauge bosons, therefore, uh, have two color indices, I and J. And they have trace zero, so that you have a components of reducible representation of, of SU3. And they have the following interactions with quarks. So you have quark of the color I emitting gluon. It can be transformed into quark with another color, J. And uh, uh, so here you have emission of gluon I, J. So the color is conserved in this index. So color <coughs> I go to this, and then J go to this uh, quark. In analogy, again, with electrodynamics, the coupling is uh, vector-like. So vector coupling. We have quark I, gamma mu. Uh, Work J, then gluon with index mu, um, J I plus emission conjugate. So this is gluon field. It has an index mu, uh, so we have Lorentz invariance, and this is completely similar to what we have in electromagnetic interactions apart from the fact that we have here these color indices and the emission of uh, gluon actually accompanied by the change of the color of the quark. So this is coupling constant. Okay. And finally, the crucial statement is that the hadrons, which we observe, are colorless combinations of quarks. <coughs> hadrons means nucleons, mesons, they are colorless.
So what are these colorless combinations? Of course, Q, I, sorry, Q, I, I with the same index. So this is colorless situation, a uh, combination. This is this is singlet of S U three. But also three quarks, Q I, Q J, K, and this is epsilon I J K. This is SU3 invariant combination. And so the, the color is, is zero. It's invariant. It doesn't change under SU3 transformations. So this is the structure of methans. And this is the structure of baryons. By the way, with the introduction of a color, now we can explain why there is no uh, hadrons observed with uh, structure QI, QI, where you have two indices uh, in, kind of, in the same way. So here is quark anti quark. But remember, in principle, you, you could uh, uh, form in SU3 flavor such a combinations. So there, remember, we have this uh, three by 3, which is expanded into 3 plus 6. That's fine as far as flavor is concerned. However, these two will have a color. And so the idea is that the color, uh, the, the hadrons which we observe have uh, zero color. And this is why we have no multiplets with, say, six uh, components and also three components. Yeah. This is actually how they theorize that the zone side baryons have that specific structure Q and Q bar and Q. Uh, mm -hmm. This is actually how they put the, in the first place, how they put uh, the theory. No, this first quark structure uh, has been kind of identified before color was introduced. And still that was a question. Why they are, Why they are not existing? And uh, yeah, why, why the three quarks do not exist, that, that was not uh, clear at the beginning. But for example, the uh, product of this is also possible. As what? Product of these two. Oh, yeah, yeah, so this is what penta quarks have. Yeah, the higher, yes, you can construct the higher of those, uh, structures. Okay. Those who will work on uh, quantum chromodynamics, of course, will go into details of these things. But I want to give uh, very shortly uh, some information about dynamics of uh, QCD. which is uh, <laughs> referred to quantum chromodynamics, right? So what is this dynamics of, of KCD? So we have gluons. And we have non-abelian symmetry, SU3. So we have eight gluons. And each gluon, in contrast to photon, has color charge, even double charge. So this is a big difference, right? So, Photon has no electric charge. And therefore, we, not, we have no interaction of photon with photon. <coughs> well, at least in lowest order. There's no coupling when we have three photons, for instance, in one vertex. Here, in contrast, we have self-interactions. Of gluons. Since they have charge, color charge. So you might find out that there are interactions of three gluons in one vertex, 
and you can have colorless interaction terms here. Or even four. Four gluons in one vertex. Appearance of this type of the interactions, so you can just combine indices, right, in the right way, and so you can have invariant combination. You understand, right? So you have here index i, say, i, j. Here you may have index uh, i, k, and here you have index uh, what is it, j, k. And so you can uh, sum up uh, all these indices, you have colorless situation, uh, combination. And the same in the case of four, four gluons. So that existence of these uh, interactions changes effective coupling of strong interactions. Um, let me write in a different way. So that modifies dependence, and I will explain. of coupling on momentum. So dependence of coupling G here on momentum. So uh, at this point I need to explain it a little bit. So we are introducing coupling constants like electric charge. So we introduce coupling of uh, electron and with photon. We have Lagrangian, we have this coupling, but physical coupling, so what we really observe in experiment, requires to take into account corrections. So, for instance, you have this type of the coupling in the lowest order, electron, electron, and gamma. But then you need to take into account that you have the following interaction. You have electron, electron, and gamma is here. You haven't studied yet this, not yet. But you can imagine, right? So this this type of bit. once you have once you have this type of elementary couplings, then you need to create uh, all possible diagrams and interactions. So it means that the electron can emit gamma and go to electron and emit again gamma, then you have this, this process. You see how it works. So of course you will have some other diagrams like this. Or you can put here. And this kind of technique is actually our tool, so we are using perturbation theory. Perturbation theory in the power of the coupling constant. So in the case of electromagnetic, we use perturbation theory in this R, uh, E, then E square, E cube, etc. So we are making this expansion. But, uh, but this is not the problem of nature. So nature is saying, okay, I have the coupling of electron with photon. And this is what you measure in your experiment. Because your experiment cannot measure separately, you know, this diagram and that one. So what you see, what you observe, all these your effects is, is summation. You need to make summation of all these diagrams. It's, this is just one loop, but you need to have also higher loop diagrams taken into account. And there are two important things. Of course, you will have some change of the coupling with respect to what you introduced their coupling in your Lagrangian initial. So not only this, you have divergences, you need to take into account these so divergences, you need to have a normalization, all, all these things. But the key point for us that although this coupling doesn't depend on momenta of particles, external particles, when you compute this type of the diagrams, and you will see eventually this, the coupling, effective coupling, so we are talking about now effective coupling, which takes into account all this correction, 
it starts to depend on momentum of external particles, particular momentum of Q of the photon. So the effective coupling constant, even in electrodynamics, right, so E effective, start to be a function of momentum. Let me just make computation of the diagram and you will see that because of, uh, so you compute not just this trivial structure, but this you will have dependence of your effective coupling on Q square. Q or Q square. So uh, I think I stopped here. Questions? You can continue. Yeah? For example, we have these lessons which are made of two quark anti quark, mm -hmm. different colors, maybe blue anti blue. Can mm -hmm. we also yellow anti yellow, mm -hmm. red anti red? So there is like. Well, you need to sum up. Yeah, you need to sum up, by the way. It's only sum is invariant. You need to make summation over this color in the no. source. So the, the actual, like, pion is. Uh, yeah, yeah, so it contains, yeah, 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 so its wave function is, is the product and then you need to, to make summation over color index because only this is color and doesn't change uh, with SU3 transformation. And for each color, coupling constants are the same value, but it doesn't favor any production of one color. No, no, so we have this, we have this, Lagra I have written Lagrangian, remember? So, and again, all this, uh, the, the same indices, you need to make summation over the same indices. I didn't tell this. So you need to put some, sorry about this, you can uh, add this. Uh, and the coupling is the same, it's just universal in front of all, all these summations. I just wonder if at the time that uh, there was a problem with, with delta plus plus to, uh, to explain the quantum number. Mm -hmm. um, if there are some, some people try to uh, explain it by the way to, to construct a theory which is um, like violate Pauli exclusion principle or uh, and w w what's, what's make this um, What's the experimental facts that contradict with that? Oh, oh, you have all this atomic structure. We, we have already good test of Pauli principle in atomic physics, right? So all these levels and uh, of course you can say, okay, maybe in quark sector you have a, a violation of Pauli principle. There is no violation of principle in, in the case of electrons, but in the case of uh, quarks you have violation of Pauli principle. Frankly, I'm not aware about that. Somebody even tried. So this uh, this uh, Pauli principle is considered so fundamental, you know, and it is uh, it, it's kind of embedded in the, in the field theory. And uh, uh, so I have no answer. I don't know. Maybe, maybe someone has tried. Maybe not. I think Greenberg was working on, but he was working on violation of Lorentz invariance and CPT, not on, on this. Actually, I had a paper on violation of power principle <laughs> for neutrinos, though, <laughs> not for quarks. So, so maybe. But there is no consistent theory about this, so there is no consistent theory. So, uh, but eventually what we have found, and we will discuss this next lecture, that uh, the uh, idea of color has been confirmed. But no, no need even to, to try this. Yes. Okay, so everybody has a, a next uh, a set of exercises. So I'll see you after tomorrow. Mm -hmm. so we are moving to the end. Huh? <laughs>